Bienvenue sur les chroniques de Kindle, le podcast vendredi tout sur votre Kindle que je suis Laine et Gourley aujourd'hui est 19 janvier 2018. Thank Alexa for that introduction in French. In case you didn't catch it, I'm Len Edgerly, and this is the Kindle Chronicles for January 19th, 2018. I'll be talking a little later in the tech tip about how you can use Alexa to translate. This week, I connected with the person who ended up being the last editor of Amazon's innovative digital literary journal, Day One. Hafiza Jeter remains at Little A, Amazon's uh, publishing's literary imprint, as an editor. And you're going to hear her talk about the conclusion of Day One, as well as what she's always looking for in new authors to publish for Little A. I'm looking for you know, work that strikes a really nuanced emotional core. Also this week, we're going to be talking about the 20 finalists in the HQ2 sweepstakes. And as I said, we'll be talking about Alexa's ability to talk in lots of different languages. I'm doing a little experiment today. It's Friday, and Darlene always challenges me to get the podcast done earlier than midnight. And today she upped the stakes and said, uh, I bet you can't get it done by noon. Well, that's about an hour from now, and I know what I want to talk about. I haven't written everything out as carefully as I usually do. But I think the look of surprise on her face if I come down and at least say I've got the audio done by noon uh, is going to be worth a challenge here. Who knows? Maybe I can handle this without a script uh, better than I think I can. The big story this week is that Amazon announced the 20 finalists for the HQ2 competition. They received 238 proposals from across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and now we know who the final 20 are. It's an interesting list. It received a lot of coverage. I'll start with the Amazon press release itself. It noted that 238 proposals had been received and that it has, quote, chosen the following 20 metropolitan areas to move to the next phase of the process, listing them in alphabetical order. That's Atlanta, Austin, Boston, Chicago, Columbus, Ohio, Dallas, Denver, Indianapolis, Los Angeles, Miami, Montgomery County, Maryland, Nashville, Tennessee, Newark, New Jersey, New York City, Northern Virginia, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Raleigh, Toronto, and Washington, D.C. Uh, some interesting uh, things that people have noted here. First of all, Toronto is on the list. That's the only city outside of the U.S. And also there are three areas that essentially are in the Washington, D.C. Uh, area, Northern Virginia, Montgomery County, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. So that might indicate that <laughs> there's at least a, a larger chance to, if you have three of the locations in the top 20 that are in your area, that's that's probably good statistically. Atlanta still seems to be at the top of everybody's list when they handicap these things, and Austin and Boston are also uh, up there. Denver, not quite so much. Amazon thanked the 238 communities that submitted proposals. Quote, getting from 238 to 20 was very tough. All the proposals showed tremendous enthusiasm and creativity. That's from Holly Sullivan, uh, who's described as a representative or spokesman for Amazon Public Policy. The release said that in the coming months, Amazon will work with each of the candidate locations to dive deeper into their proposals, request additional information, and evaluate the feasibility of a future partnership that can accommodate the company's hiring plan. Recode had a good story covering this, including a chart which captures some of the key data for the top 20 cities. In the article which Ronnie Mola wrote for Recode on January 18th, the day that the announcement was made, they noted that the cost to employ workers, both tech and non-tech, is cheaper in Toronto, Canada than in any of the other cities on the Amazon's finalist list. Uh, so that's an explanation of why Toronto's on there, perhaps. I can't believe that in the current environment where there's so much focus on creating jobs in the U.S. that Amazon would be so bold as to locate the... Uh, headquarters in Toronto, but you never know. Interesting that it's on the top 20 list. The other thing which Recode notes is that 
payroll alone makes up about 50% for companies like Amazon, and the real estate leases and rentals make up just 4%. So although you're certainly looking at the cost of locating a huge facility that employs 50,000 people, uh, the actual cost of hiring those people ends up being pretty significant. Their uh, ranking list does show Atlanta uh, as number one and then Austin and Boston. Uh, they have tech talent rank. Uh, Aust- Atlanta's five, Austin's eight, Boston's nine. One thing which they measure is time from downtown airport in minutes. And on that one, Boston is only 12 minutes. They've got a location uh, outside of Boston at the, the former Suffolk Downs racetrack, and that's only 12 minutes from Logan. I, I heard on a local Boston radio station here that Somerville, which is the town next to us here in Cambridge, is also mentioned somehow in this final 20 list. So uh, apparently there's a site in Somerville that's in the running as well as the one that's talked about most near Logan Airport in Boston. Denver, by comparison, gets dinged, I'm sure, because it's a 36-minute ride from Denver International Airport, which is a fantastic new airport, but it's quite a ways outside the city, especially compared with the old airport. Port Stapleton, which was that probably would have been five minutes from downtown, but it just couldn't handle the growth that Denver was seeing. Nick Wingfield, who does an excellent job covering Amazon for the New York Times these days, started his coverage of the top 20 announcement comparing the cities to college applicants waiting for a message that they got accepted. And he got a hold of the actual note that Boston received on Thursday, a cryptic four, uh, four-sentence four note informing them that they'd made the finals. And the note said, we would like to move Boston forward in the process so we can continue to learn more about your community, your talent, and potential real estate options. That's from Holly Sullivan, the executive who was quoted in the release. Please email me back with available times for a call so we can discuss next steps. And that message went out to the other 20 cities as well. Newark is interesting because it it is a more distressed economy, although there's been lots of growth and Audible, an Amazon subsidiary, has been a big part of the uh, renaissance or reemergence of Newark. And the New Jersey has promised up to $7 billion in tax incentives to bring Amazon to Newark. That, that's kind of an eye-popping offer that received some criticism as well. I can see the logic behind Newark's bid, uh, partly because when I spoke with Donald Katz a little over three years ago, the founder and CEO of Audible, his passion for Newark and for keeping Audible local located there and growing there as kind of a a corporate uh, responsibility mission. And it matches some of the uh, profile of Amazon in Seattle, although Amazon's growth in Seattle has caused some problems. There's been a real commitment on Bezos's part and the other top team for uh, locating the company in the city, which has uh, advantages for the economy there and also for employees who can walk to work and that sort of thing. So when you think about the impact that locating Amazon's second headquarters would have on Newark as opposed to New York City, which the same general area but two rivals in the same region, uh, I don't know. I, that that uh, that one kind of rings a bell of uh, fitting with kind of an aspirational aspect of Amazon's previous decisions to locate uh, in Seattle. We'll see. Wingfield's article concluded with some critics of the overall HQ2 project. Ed Glazer, a professor of economics at Harvard here in Cambridge, study cities. He predicted that the winner of the contest would have in place the kind of positive economic attributes that mean it wouldn't necessarily need Amazon to thrive. And then his quote was, At its best, the competition for Amazon has spurred cities to think about how to improve their quality of life more generally. At its worst, the competition has become a distraction and a contest for throwing cash at the giant. I don't think that's a a fair characterization of uh, all of the city's plans. Boston and Denver in particular, I know, made a point of saying we're not going to be giving huge tax incentives because we think we've got economic and location benefits that speak for themselves. As I have been reading the articles about the top 20 list of finalists, I, I came across a fascinating piece in today's Financial Times by Tim Harford. And it's in this genre of articles discussing the antitrust implications of Amazon's current dominance in retail. 
And but it's it's uh, one that I haven't seen anything like before. I, I highly recommend it. I'm not sure I've subscribed to the Financial Times, so the link that I'll have in the show notes uh, may not be available. But, it, but it's the case for ending Amazon's dominance. Antitrust authorities should not be making life easy for incumbents. And it, it starts out listing. In fact, the, the most of the article is very favorable toward Amazon, starting out with why it's so easy for consumers to love Amazon because of the choice and the convenience, uh, talking about how many companies have gotten their start using uh, AWS, and they make people, uh, competitors like Walmart, work really hard. Uh, so a lot of positive aspects. And then going even deeper, uh, quoting some experts as talking about how many companies are impatiently funneling cash to investors and executives rather than taking a long-term view. Amazon, of course, doesn't do that. It's the shining counter example, he calls it. If only there were a few more companies like Amazon, capitalism would be in a happier spot. But there's the rub. There aren't more companies like it. It's unique and an increasingly terrifying force in online commerce. Uh, should regulators act? If so, how? He then proceeds to take issue with uh, a piece that I've talked about, I think, in the past. It was uh, written by uh, someone at uh, Yale Law School, Lena Kahn, Amazon's Antitrust Paradox. And he takes issue with some of her thesis and it says there really is a problem with cumbersome and unnecessary meddling in a dynamic and rapidly evolving marketplace. Uh, so it's the idea that we need to return to a kind of antitrust prosecution that just goes after bigness because and really gets involved in that. He says, I am deeply uneasy about Amazon's apparently unassailable position in online retail. So on the other hand, there is this uneasiness because of what he calls the company's formidable entrenched advantages. Those advantages were earned, but they can also be abused. Uh, the, the sort of breathtaking conclusion of all this in light of the 20 cities wanting to be HQ2 is as follows. There are no easy options, but it is time to look for a way to split Amazon into two independent companies, each with the strength to grow and invest. If Amazon is such a wonderful company, wouldn't two Amazons be even better? Well, you can see where I'm going with this. Uh, is it possible that Bezos and his team see far enough into the future to understand that this issue of the proper role for antitrust in the age of dominance by huge technology companies might well lead to uh, a breaking up of Amazon into two companies? And if that happened and there were two corporate headquarters already in existence, the impact on the company's shareholders, on employees, on customers uh, might be less than if the company were sort of cut down the middle by regulators and, and two companies had to figure out how to uh, begin operating independently. Uh, obviously, the idea of a second headquarters, given that Amazon is one company, uh, doesn't really fit that. But in the descriptions of HQ2, it's always said that the new headquarters is going to be equally uh, important and big, and uh, it, it's not going to be kind of a, a pilot location of Seattle. It's going to be its own headquarters. So interesting possibility that wh whoever it lands HQ2, depending on what happens to antitrust philosophy and thinking in the next five, ten years or more, uh, might well end up having uh, the headquarters of one or the other halves of Amazon. I, I don't know whether that would be good. I, I, I see these arguments unfolding in thoughtful places like the Financial Times, and of course I'm a huge fan of Amazon, uh, so I don't come into this thinking, boy, this is a a uh, pernicious entity that needs to be broken up. But I think that thoughtful people are asking questions about what is the impact of having Google, Amazon, Apple, these few companies controlling so much of the economy. Uh, and uh, they, if they're benign now, what happens if they, they end up with uh, something less benign as their uh, leadership or, or motivating way of being in the world? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. If you think two Amazons would be better than one or you think one is just fine, you can drop me an email at podchronicles at gmail.com. Well, status report, it is now four minutes before noon, and I've got, let's see, including the interview, which is in the can, I've got about 
34 minutes, so I've got 10 minutes to go. <laughs> I'm not going to make my noon target for Darlene. So as usual, she's going to be proven right that there was no way I would get it done by noon. But I'm grateful that she uh, put that challenge ahead of me because at noon I'm way further down the road than I w would have been otherwise. And I spotted when I was trying to not be distracted by working on the show that there is a Tesla 3 on display on Boylston Street in Boston today. So if I get this done pretty soon we might be able to head down there and see what this car looks like we've got one on order but we've never actually seen one except for the photos and i bet there's going to be a big big crowd down there to check out this new much more affordable tesla that according to emails that we've received uh, should be delivered sometime this year no idea whether that'll be next month or december if it's december the good news is we'll have a garage built here in cambridge for it with a post that we'll be able to plug it into and charge it overnight there is one other news item that I want to catch up uh, that actually broke last week, and this was a donation of $33 million by Jeff Bezos and his wife, Mackenzie, to a Dreamers Scholarship Fund, and the organization is thedream.us. Uh, they said in a statement that the contribution would pay for 1,000 scholarships for so-called Dreamers to attend college and that it was the largest donation in the group's history, Dreamers being uh, children who were brought to the U.S. Uh, by someone else uh, and, and have grown up here uh, without proper documentation under the immigration laws. The quote from Jeff Bezos uh, touched me. He said, my dad came to the U.S. when he was 16 as part of Operation Pedro Pan. This is a statement that uh, he put out in relation to the news. He's referring to his Cuban-American father, Mike Bezos. Uh, Jeff continued, he landed in this country alone and unable to speak English. With a lot of grit and determination and the help of some remarkable organizations in Delaware, my dad became an outstanding citizen, and he continues to give back to the country that he feels blessed him in so many ways. Mackenzie and I are honored to be able to help today's dreamers by funding these scholarships. Uh, there's also information in this article, this is from Talking Points Memo, that explains kind of how this came about. Uh, the organization, the dream.us, one of the co-founders of it is the former publisher of the Washington Post, Donald Graham. Uh, we know that Donald Graham and Jeff Bezos uh, knew each other well, were friends of a sort, and that led to the purchase of the Post by Bezos' personal investment firm in 2013. Uh, on that topic, uh, Darlene and I saw the post at the Kendall Square Theater here in Cambridge uh, last week, I think. Uh, a very powerful movie uh, portraying the period in the, when Catherine Ga Graham was fairly new in running the post after the tragic suicide of her husband. Uh, and then came the uh, struggle over the Pentagon Papers and a uh, fight uh, before the stream, Supreme Court, which uh, the the post future was really on the line because they were trying to raise money at the the time, and here came something which could have triggered a force majeure clause in the effort to to raise money. Uh, Meryl Streep, uh, Tom Hanks playing the uh, Catherine Graham and Ben Bradley, the the charismatic editor of, of the Post at that time. It's impossible to watch that movie without thinking of uh, Jeff Bezos purchasing the Post and whether there might come a time when he he sitting in Catherine Graham's shoes would be forced to uh, show some bravery on behalf of the Post public mission. Certainly hope it doesn't come to that, but it's it's been threatened in the past. In some ways, he would have even more to lose if somehow Amazon was being put in play by uh, someone's intention to muzzle the post or make it more difficult for the post to do its work under the First Amendment. I think that Donald Graham had kind of an instinctual sense of finding someone who would have as much courage in that kind of a situation as his mother had uh, in the period that's portrayed in the movie. But uh, even if you're not sort of thinking about these issues, it's a, it's a terrific movie that uh, will keep your attention throughout. Highly recommended. For the tech tip, I'll give you some background on that opening of the show that I had Alexa say in French. Uh, it turns out that there's a built-in translation capability to Alexa. In other words, uh, for Spanish, German, French, Japanese, and Italian, you can simply say Alexa, translate, and then a phrase into, and then a language. 
Alexa, translate. I am getting pretty close to finishing the show into Japanese. I am getting pretty close to finishing that show in Japanese. その show を仕上げに近いかなり言えています。Alexa, translate. I hope I am finished recording by the time my wife returns into Spanish. I hope I am finished recording by the time my wife returns in Spanish. Espero que estoy terminado de grabar el momento que mi esposa regresa. So, if you are recording a short phrase in any one of those five languages, you just give the command as I've demonstrated. There's a way to open it up to many more languages if you use a, an Alexa skill named Translated. I think there's others, but that's the one that I found that seems to work pretty well.、Uh, to your Alexa device, you would just say, Alexa, enable the translated skill.、Uh, at that point, you can translate into Arabic, Italian, Czech, Welsh, Danish, Swiss German,、uh, Norwegian. Russian, uh, uh, it's just a, a whole bunch of languages here. And this is how that sounds to use the skill, which I've already downloaded to my device. Alexa, open the translated skill. Welcome to translated skill. What would you like to translate? My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon into Welsh. My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon in Welsh. s My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon in Welsh. My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon in Welsh. My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon in Welsh. My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon in Welsh. My wife is doing errands. I hope she returns home soon in Welsh. My wife is doing errands. Is for supper into Russian. I am getting hungry. What is for supper in Russian is? Я получаю голодный для ужина. So you can see. Do you want to translate anything else? No. Hear you soon. Bye now. What you have there when you're using the skill is it's a bit like a chatbot, or you're getting into a more conversational interface, which,、uh, I, as you could hear, you can slow down. The statement in the foreign language you can repeat, and it's sort of a back and forth compared with the basic ability to translate that you have in Alexa with those original five languages. I'm not sure in what situation this would be more than kind of a, a party. A trick, but I suppose if you had a visitor from a foreign country and you wanted to have some handy translation, you could be relying on Alexa to do that. If you have a show and you want to have her record an opening for you in a foreign language, that's possible too by using、uh, voice memos on your iPhone. Alexa, translate. Time now for the interview into Italian. Time now for the interview in Italian is. Tempo ora per l'intervista. Hafiza Jeter received her BA in English and Economics from Clemson University and her MFA in Poetry from Columbia College, Chicago. She is an editor at Little A, the literary imprint of Amazon Publishing. And until December 27th of last year, she was also the editor of Day One, the weekly digital literary magazine that Amazon launched in October of 2013. December 27th did mark the last issue of Day One, a publication which I subscribed to from the first issue and I had great admiration for. I was glad to be able to talk with Hafiza for this week's show. To learn more about the closing of Day One and the transition it marks for Little A, I reached her at Amazon Publishing in New York City on Wednesday, January 17th, and I began by asking why Amazon Publishing ended publication of Day One. It's been our privilege to be able to send readers a weekly literary treat that included poems, stories, and what I just have to call remarkable illustrations every Wednesday for four years. So we set out initially to connect readers with emerging writers and artists, but also to, especially to invest in emerging writers and artists. That was the goal, and I think that's what we accomplished.、Um, but that doesn't mean that 
you know, Amazon has lost her commitment to short fiction. We absolutely are still committed to it. And we still have our Kindle single store as well as uh, Amazon original stories, which I th- are you familiar with? I think yeah, I, I'm kind of – what's the difference? Is I, I It started out as Kindle singles, and now it, recently it's there's Amazon original stories. Are they different or are they just two names for the same thing? No, they're different. So – Kindle Singles is, so whenever you want to go get some short fiction, you head on over to the Kindle Singles stores and you can get anything you want. So with Amazon Original Stories, we really wanted to kind of do something more to really satiate our our readers' needs for great short content. So it is, Amazon Original Stories is an imprint of Amazon Publishing. It's a digital exclusive imprint. So editors go out, they acquire new writers and also some like they acquire established writers to have them specifically write content for Amazon original stories. And so Amazon original stories are available on the Kindle singles uh, store. I see. So I talked with Dean Koontz last week. His was an Amazon original story. As he described it, Amazon approached him and said, do you have any stories that you'd like to publish? And that's how it came about. So it sounds like there's sort of a proactive step that Amazon takes to approach writers for Amazon original stories. Absolutely. Because I think, which is also great, because writers have so many stories in them, you know, so it's great to like go out to them, to writers, and be like, tell us your story. And there was investment in the writers for uh, day one, because I know there was actual payment for publication, and in a lot of literary magazines or journals, uh, that's not the case. It's it's considered a, a real plus of the writer just to be published. But uh, can you say anything about the, the, the payments that were made to poets and writers for day one and how important that was in in the whole project? I mean, I will just take a second and speak from the point of, for example, I'm also a writer. I'm a poet as well, and I write essays. And so, you know, it's very rare that when I submit work that I'll get paid for it. And so I think one of the things that paying writers does is invest in not just like the work product that they had to expend to write that because it's when you're writing, you're not doing something else. So it's an investment to kind of acknowledge that what you're doing is valuable. So I think that's one of the great things about day one and that paying writers. And it also gives you kind of as a writer, an emotional boost. I I think that must be the case. Do you know of people who, had their debut in day one and then they went on to publish a book or go to the New Yorker and other sort of major outlets? What what, what are some of the su- success stories in terms of really helping some writers get their starts? Oh, yeah. Now, that's going to be exciting question. when that so happens. That's one of the really cool things about day one. Um, for example, there's been like a there's been there's several examples I can give you. For example, Little A editor Carmen Johnson discovered uh, a writer Lydia Thays via the day one submissions queue. She loved Lydia's story, and they actually went on to do a book together, a Kindle in motion novel called uh, Children of the Salt Road. And then another example is. After Carmen discovered writer Cody Shear's work through day one, she went on to acquire her short story collection, which included that story collection included the story she published in day one, When a Camel Breaks Your Heart. And then we went on to publish, you know, we went on to publish Cody's debut novel, Midair. And then for other writers who found a path outside of Little A, Day One published a story by Britt Bennett, who went on to publish and wanted to write the bestseller, The Mothers, which I think a lot of your, re, uh, your listeners will be familiar with. Yeah, it, it's, it's really great to be able to do that. If you had published in other comparable journals, were you not able to be considered for a publication in Day One? It really was sort of exclusively for day, uh, debut authors. Our request was that writers with books don't submit to us. So we looked for writers without books. And that's kind of what we use for our meter for emerging because that can mean a lot of things in today's world. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a reasonable way to, to sort of decide who, who uh, is able to submit. 
So there have been uh, over 200 issues published in that period, and will they be available in kind of a permanent archive? Yeah, so for all day one stories, a week after they were released in the day one issue, they were uh, they go up in the Kindle single store, and so all stories published in day one are still available via the Kindle single store and will remain available. Can you search that archive somehow? Like, say I... I have come across a poet, and I want to see if uh, he or she has published in day one. Do you know of any way to to sort of search by an author through that whole archive of all the 200-plus the issues? So if you have a specific name that you love, when you put their name into the Amazon store and search for them, if they had a story in day one, it will pop up as a single. Oh, cool. And then there's also... Um, when you look look at uh, search for day one on Amazon store, there's a page that will tell you everyone who ever published in day one. That includes poets, writers, and illustrators. Well, now Amazon Publishing, of course, is still going strong. And then, what what sorts of other initiatives do you do you have in shorter content as opposed to full length novels and uh, more more sort of story length content? We always have available our Kindle single store and. You know, our new venture, the Amazon, uh, Amazon Original Stories. Uh, as I said, that's a digital exclusive imprint of Amazon Publishing. Um, so that gives our readers their short fiction and their, non, their nonfiction that can be read in a single sitting. So I think the Amazon Original Stories demonstrates that as a publisher, we're always looking for new ways to innovate on behalf of, off, on behalf of our authors and to connect readers and authors with, you know, together. How about poetry? Are, are there any specific uh, ways that you're providing a, a chance for poets to, to find an audience the, th- through Kindle? Last year, I believe, we published two poetry books. You know, we're looking at the end of the day for great writing, and so we're open to a lot of things. Uh, little A, I, we've talked about it in the past in the show, but let's let's remind my listeners, among all the various imprints of Amazon Publishing, what, what does Little A publish? At Little A, our focus is on the literary fiction and nonfiction. How do you know when something's literary? Well, I think that goes along with each person's taste, but I think I'm looking for, you know, work that strikes a really nuanced emotional core. It's, it's usually sort of compared with genre mysteries or uh, romance i think nuance is a good word to sort of point toward the kinds of things that differentiate a a more literary work absolutely sometimes i i and i've got an mfa so i i I love all of the literary stuff but it it almost seems like sometimes you know it's literary if it's difficult to read (laughs) that's one way but (laughs) you know i think for me literary fiction and nonfiction it's you know work that writing that i've lost myself in yeah that's a good way to put it uh now i saw you published a poem in the new yorker i did march of last year that's uh the mount olympus of of uh, in the poetry biz how did that come about um you know i submitted through the regular submittable submission queue you know i think as a poet, you're, the New Yorker is one of those things that's perpetually on your list, and then you just submit and submit, just thinking that you'll be submitting for the rest of your life. And I guess I got the right poem, the right time, right editor, so it was fantastic. How many uh, poems had you submitted before that one was accepted, would you guess? I think in this case, like, I hadn't I'd maybe submitted two other times. I've been a bit judicious about it, um, so I submitted about two other times, but yeah. it definitely wasn't my, my first submission and accept, acceptance. And that poem, the title was The Break-In, right? Yes. And uh, it, I, when I found it, there was a, an MP3 file so that on the New Yorker uh, website, apparently people could hear you reading it. Yeah. Did you go to a special deluxe New Yorker audio studio to record it, or how <laughs> did you do that? Um, yeah, I went, I headed over to uh, their offices in lower Manhattan and they have a little, they have a kind of like a little sound studio where I recorded it. Huh. That must've been exciting. It was great. I took a picture for my father, of course. <laughs> That's great. 
Well, now you're at Little A, and uh, you're an editor at Little A. What what what's your job there? What are your responsibilities? So I, along with the rest of uh, my little A te- little A team, I acquire literary fiction and nonfiction. What's the process by which you end up considering something for acquisition? Personally, I'm looking everywhere. So I do my best to really stay tapped into the writing world, which you know, is helpful because I'm a writer, so I have access to these spaces. So I'm constantly going to book parties, readings, conferences, like wherever writers are. And I'm also even looking on online spaces. So spaces like Facebook groups or Twitter, um, really kind of keeping my eye on what writers care about and who other writers are reading as well. Um, but we also, you know, work with agents and we get, we get a lot of uh, manuscripts that way. Mm. Can you give some examples of some of the titles that Lille is publishing this year, 2018? Yeah. So in March, we'll be publishing Kristen Chen's second novel with Little A. She wrote Soy Sauce for Beginners. Um, and her second book will be Bury What You Cannot Take. One book that we're really excited about also, uh, we just published Halsey Street. It's a debut novel by Naima Coster. It, got, it recently got a starred review in Kirkus, and People Magazine called it, let me, I want to make sure I quote this properly, A Masterful Tale of Family Failures and Forgiveness. It takes place in you know, a rapidly gentrifying uh, bedside neighborhood, so as a New Yorker, it's really exciting to read because it's all so familiar, and that's a great book. Um, we have memoirs coming out from food writer Hannah Howard, from actress Nancy Baldier, uh, from true crime writer Harold Schechter. And in the fall, I will be publishing a great debut fiction title called Late Air by a writer named Jackie Gilbert. Late Air actually follows a Yale cross-country coach and his wife, which, who's a rare books librarian and curator, as their lives kind of diverge and intersect through the years. And it's a really, really powerful and gripping story. And in 2018, do you know uh, how many titles total you'll end up publishing this year? The plan is to publish about 20 books this year. For anyone who wants to keep, just keep up with the news of our books, they can follow us on Twitter at Little A Books. Now, I saw that you were one of 27 women chosen out of 230 applicants for a fellowship at the 92nd Street Y, the Women in Power program. So that looked like another exciting you, – you've had a big year here. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell, me about, tell me about that program. Women in Power is a unique fellowship offered by 92nd Street Y, and their goal is to address the lack of gender parity in senior level leadership. So what they do is that they connect women with peer support, mentorship, training, and coaching to help us advance to positions of power. So it's especially a great uh, program to be a part of because I think it aligns well with Little A because Little A, one of their tenants is kind of like paying attention to inclusivity. And so it goes really well with this program. How much time will you spend uh, participating in, in the Women in Power activities? We do. We have workshops about, I think, once a month. And they have supplemental things that we can attend if we'd like. But we have, we have I think, dedicated mentors that we'll be working with. It kicks off at the end of the month, so I'll be able to tell you more then. I imagine you had to write a, uh, an extremely well-written uh, application describing what you hope to accomplish through the, the fellowship. Do, do you remember what you submitted and what your aspiration was that you would be able to do because of being accepted by it? My main impetus to apply to this program was that not everyone is in a position where they grow up or come through their career having a mentor. And then it's especially more precarious when you want to strive to reach a level where you look and no one that looks like you is there. Um, So that was a big thing for me that I want to, just as an African-American woman, I want to be able to be in a position where I can reach back and where I can help, you know, young women of color ascend these positions and then have not just get into these positions, but look around and see people that look like them when they get there. Right. So you'll be learning things in this program that will enable you to help others. Absolutely. Hmm. 
can you tell me a little bit about your personal story? Did did you come here from Nigeria or your parents? What What's your sort of story that, that that's led you to this exciting place? I was born in Nigeria, um, moved here when I was about three with my family. In terms of how I got into publishing, I mean, I've always, always loved books. I was, I was a child who read more than they talked. <laughs> and so were like books really gave me like a language to kind of like address and figure out the world that I was in. And then as I got older, you know, I was like writing poems and notebooks, still reading voraciously. And as I went through my path to get my my path to get my MFA, I started really kind of looking around and assessing the world I was in, and saw that there are a lot of people who are figuring out how to do this full time. And you know, I personally think that one of the biggest responsibilities is how you take care of a story someone trusts you with. That has always kind of attracted me to publishing and editing, editing, that I am someone that I feel that, you know, my personal experience has made me so I can understand and be open to a lot of different types of stories. For example, growing up, I grew up in uh, a jointly like, uh, Muslim and Southern Baptist ha- household. Wow. I'm used to a lot of viewpoints spinning around, a lot of different stories, and so it helped me see you know, a lot of different types of stories as universal stories. And so I think, you know, that's kind of what led me here. And so, you know, I've worked in literary nonprofits pretty much since I started working and I've been slowly kind of like working my way, you know, to this position where I can really help writers kind of like bring their best books forward, especially for debut writers, because your first book just means the world to you, you know? Yeah. That's an interesting way you put it, to take care of a story that someone entrusts uh, to you. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you take care of a story versus, I suppose, the opposite would be to somehow uh, mess with a story, not meaning to, but the, the, what sort of mistakes do you think it's important to avoid when you've been entrusted with somebody's story? I think one of the first things that I do, especially if it's someone who is writing outside of ex- an experience that I'm familiar with, I think the first and important thing that I do is I believe them. I believe them when they tell me about their life and their story, and I start from there. You know, it's important to, you're someone with an MFA, so you know that, like, when you're editing, like, you know, a classmate's work in your MFA, to not edit it with how you write, but what they're trying to say. Right. And so at the end of the day, I try to honor their voices, and I try to avoid things like, okay, because... I haven't experienced this, that doesn't mean it rings false. That just means I haven't experienced it. And so, you know, in those cases, you know, with writing, it's like, you know, the trick is with writing is a lot of times the more specific you get, the more universal something becomes. So in order to, you know, like, for example, taking care of their stories, if there's something that I don't quite understand, I won't, I'm not going to say like, oh, that's not relatable, take it out. I'm going to ask for more. Show Uh, me how this is all of us. More detail. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's interesting. When you look ahead uh, in 2018, any interesting publishing trends that you see on the horizon that excite you, uh, given that you're going to be participating in them through Little A? Yeah, absolutely. So in 2018, I'm especially looking forward to the trend that's what we're seeing is the increased visibility for writers of color, especially women of color. I think, you know, obviously there's still much to be done regarding publishing and marginalized voices, but I think that we're at a time where more marginalized voices are finding platforms and publishers who won't just, who are just willing to tell their stories, but they're actually excited to tell their stories. Um, So I'm looking forward to more books that kind of explore the layers of what it means to be a woman, a person of color, an immigrant, to be Muslim, to be transgender, to be queer, and also books that, you know, grapple with class consciousness. What does it mean to escape poverty or to actually just be stuck in poverty? I think that they're really, you know, interesting stories and important stories that need to be heard from that. And then I'm also really excited about, you know, what we've seen in the past couple of years, and I hope this trend continues to rise, of visibility for African writers. Whenever I see a Nigerian writer, I'm always super excited. And I think that, you know, the popularity of African writers is what happens when you unlock the gates, you know, because they were all there before, you know, 
American publishing found them, you know? And so that's really exciting to me. But I will say that I kind of, I do hesitate to call any of these types of books trends. I think at little a, I like to think of them more as commitments because these are the types of stories that we as a whole at Little A, I think are committed to both as readers and as editors. And I think that's important. I have been speaking with Hafiza Jeter, an editor at Little A. That's the literary imprint of Amazon Publishing. Thanks very much, Hafiza. All right. Thanks so much, Len. It's been a pleasure. That's it for this week. Next week's guest will be John Fine, Amazon's former evangelist to the book industry, who in October of last year joined one of my favorite publishers, Open Road Integrated Media, as senior vice president and publisher. Darlene and I and the Yorkie Claire will return to Denver early Sunday morning after a very full two weeks here in Cambridge. We're looking forward to the warmer weather out there, and then we'll be returning in February because there are a couple of fam- important family birthdays coming. This is Len Edgerly for the Kindle Chronicles from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my show. Have a great day. Bye.